You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. And welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt. And I'd like to begin our proceedings here today by calling out to the helping spirits to be with us. So I call out first to your ancestral helping spirits and to mine. I call out to those who bring all that is good and true and beautiful in our ancestral lines to us, the living. They bring us a legacy that we can lean into to help us to learn from the mistakes of those who have gone before us, to draw courage, to do new things, to draw strength, to stay the course, and to draw from the deep wisdom of the things humans already know about what is actually necessary to be a good human. And so I call out to these ancestral human, ancestral energies to be with us here today. And as I give gratitude for their presence, let us reach through the humans who have been here for a relatively short time on this earth and reach out to all of the rest of life that has been here longer than there was ever a human and much of it will be here long after. A call out to all of those many different manifestations of that original spark of life that brought life as we know it here to the face of this planet. We give gratitude to the many, many, many manifestations and to that diversity. And we ask all of those energies to help to teach us how to be together in a way that is both beautiful and complex. How to be here living in a way that is both diverse and harmonious. How do we do this in a way that we allow the true awe of the reality of life here on earth to infuse our every day? How do we remember to make magic? And so we call out to these non-human ancestors to be with us here today. We call them all in to gather around us and to help us to do a better job today being who we are. And so let us call ourselves from whatever it is that we might be, drawing our energy into our head and let it coalesce there into a little coherent ball of light. Let it move down into our heart and let it be reminded of that which we truly value in life. Let us draw our energy down into our belly and remember that we are incarnate beings here in the world, walking this earth in form. And it is our job to be here and to do what we've come here to do in a way that is good for all living things. And let us take a moment and give gratitude to the earth herself for giving us a place to do that, a place that allows us to learn, to make mistakes, to grow, and to change. And we give gratitude for the fact that we can actually change anything here as long as we are still breathing. So with enormous gratitude to the earth and wonder and awe in our hearts for the simple fact of life itself. Let us move our energy down through the earth, letting our gratitude and awe pour out in each layer of the earth until we reach the very center of the earth. To anchor ourselves firmly there, to connect into those energies that draw their power out of darkness, silence, stillness, calm. Let us connect into these energies that are before all the wild and beautiful abundance that is here on earth. We give gratitude to that which is before, that which nourishes all, that which restores. And let us draw into that energy as we would reach into a spring of cool, clear water on a hot day. And let us draw that energy up into our body, into our life, into our proceedings in this day. We call up that energy that gives us the wisdom of manifestation, the knowing of how to be here in form in a good way. We call up this energy that renews, restores, replenishes. We call these energies in and use these energies to get a sense of who we are, where we stand, and what we stand for. 
to tune in to those energies that have true heart and meaning in our lives and make sure that our efforts in this day are motivated by those things, that which we care about, that which really matters. Let us not be distracted. Let us not do what is mindless, but let us connect to that which is right and true and real for each one of us. And as we set that as our intention for the day, let us come into right relationship with ourself, right relationship with each other, right relationship with the environment, and right relationship with the invisible world. And as we come in and realize these many interconnected layers or systems of life, let us open ourselves to the big reality of the oneness of all things, that all things are energy, they are all connected, everything affects everything else. And in that, let us find our place in that great oneness. And from that place, let us reach our energy up from our belly to our heart, our heart to our mind, up and out into the sky above you, whatever weather that might be, whatever time of day you might be listening, reaching up and out through the very thin atmosphere and out into the cosmos and all the way up to the highest power of the universe. And by whatever name you call that energy, call out to it and connect. See yourself in it and it in you and draw this energy down, bringing in to yourself, into your day, into these proceedings, drawing in the essence energy of blessing, the energy of protection, the benevolence of this universe, inspiration and illumination, and beneficence. We call these energies in today, draw them into our head and heart and belly, sending it down to the earth, letting the earth and sky connect these two great legendary lovers, those who are at the root of so many of the stories of the first peoples of this planet. We let earth and sky come together in that great love. Let it awaken the spirit of your own human heart and let your human heart be alive with the power of your own capacity for transformation. And may you find in that human heart that energy that is yours, uniquely yours, to bring to the world and may you find the courage there to do something in this day large or small to bring those gifts into full manifestation and share them with the rest of life and for all the spirit help that we have that helps us to do precisely that i give great thanks i also want to give thanks to the listeners uh, who have sorted out how to make automatic monthly donations We aren't really looking for you to give $5,000, but it's not unrealistic to think a thousand of you might give five. And I really appreciate those of you that have figured out how to make an automatic payment of some modest sum in some wonderful currency. And in doing so, you've helped to sustain the the continuation of Why Shamanism Now, the maintaining of the archives, which are now uh, coming close to 500 hours about the application of shamanic skills to our contemporary life. And so for all of you that have found ways to support us financially or to support us in other ways that share the show and help the show to grow, who use these teachings, bring them to your journey circles, take them into your own shamanic practice, wrestle with them, ask questions, and in this way begin to spread this possibility that we could use shamanic skills to change our world in ways that that need to be changed and can begin to shore up those aspects of life that need to continue as they have always been. And so thank you all for all that you are doing and thank you for joining me here today. If you have um, questions about today's show, the topic is Angry Kids, Ancestral Healing and Climate Change. So if you have questions about any of that, strange kettle of fish, you are welcome to call in at 512-772-1938, or you can Skype in from the co-creatornetwork.com site, or as always, you can email me at christina at lastmaskcenter.org. So may what needs to be said be said here today, and what needs to be heard be heard, and may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things. So I've been sharing a lot of shows lately about ancestral healing for a number of reasons. Um, Three, basically. One, 
is it clearly, desperately needs to be done. Number two, everybody can do something. And this is the message that I've been trying to get across is not only is it needed and why and does it benefit you to do it, but everybody can learn to do the basics. And yes, there's some big messes that people that are skilled and interested should do on your behalf. But there's a whole lot of basic stuff that everybody could be doing. And then the third reason that I'm sharing it right now is because I have an online, a live online class coming up that can teach you how to do that basic stuff in a really good way. So this is why I've been talking a lot about ancestral healing because the need is so profoundly in our faces, at least here in the United States, and I don't think we are alone in simply seeing the living result of the unresolved beliefs and values and actions and problem solving of our descendants. For example, solving life's problems by climbing up someone else's back to get what you think you want. That's a pretty typical human behavior not only here in the United States, and the patterns of having done that in vast systemic ways throughout history all around the globe lead to both the patterns of perpetrators and the patterns for those who get victimized. And these play out lifetime after lifetime, generation after generation. And as you hear the tone of my voice and me sighing, frankly, I'm just tired of it. I'm really tired. It brings me to tears because this is the same thing over and over. And the capacity for us to change that is right here in front of us. If we simply gain a simple skill set to do something new and different and to set things right in the ancestral realm. So, My point is that there are very, very deeply unresolved ancestral patterns at play in the world today. Many other things also need to happen and be addressed. I am not saying if we just heal the ancestors, everything poof will be different. What I am saying is if we heal the unresolved energies of the ancestors, the reality that we see will be different. The version of ourselves that we see will be different. And most importantly, what we see as possible will be different. And we will be able to do what we need to do. So these unresolved patterns, they keep us from seeing reality accurately and seeing the fullness of possibility around us. And they tend to encourage us to stay in patterns of illness, unwellness, disease, depression, um, disheartened, alienated, disconnected, and either maintaining the system or at odds with the system, but not getting it together to actually change the systems of injustice. So these unresolved ancestral patterns are at the root of the anger and the vitriol that we see on social media, particularly in the news in the last week, is really um, caused me to pause, (laughs) has been the incredible anger and vitriol that grown men and adults, not all men, are spitting at children. It, it, it is leaves me speechless, which is a little problematic on a podcast. But it really, honestly, it leaves me speechless. That and and more importantly, these aren't children that are railing against the machine or um, rebels without a cause. These are children that are simply advocating. That in their future, for their children, there will be clean water to drink. There will be solid ground that's not submerged under the world's oceans to live on. There will be clean air to breathe. And there, being puked on by the toxic, childish, unresolved emotional energy of grown adults... 
It is really astounding. So clearly, the status quo of this whole human family with all of its exquisitely beautiful diversity is being profoundly affected by changes in the environment and because of changes in the environment, changes in our climate. And while cycles and change are a constant in nature, certainly, the effects of human beings on this planet are a great force that is way beyond the norm of nature moving through its cyclic way of sustainability. And the force of humans on this planet is collective. It is made by many choices, many actions, much non-action. It's made, uh, and our choices, our actions all come out of beliefs. And so these beliefs, ideas about the world, typical choices that people make and actions that they take are also found in the unresolved energy of the ancestors. But the important thing for us, the living, since of course the dead don't care anymore, but for us, the living, this, this, there is a direct connection here between these collective actions and inactions of human beings and and the inability of all of the rest of life which would basically be nature and the earth the air the water everything to be able to sustain clean water to drink clean safe air to breathe and solid ground for everyone to live on solid ground for us to grow our food on so that we have something to eat so we're seeing children like 16 year old Greta Thunberg taking action and speaking out demanding that the adult, adults on this planet take action to secure a future for her so finally after decades of paying for our western status quo life paying for that status quo life with the resources that will belong should belong to our children those children are calling foul right Teens of today around the world are saying, whoa, time out, grownups. You have already spent my future on your excessive presence. And I'm asking you to stop and live differently. Do something different. And so then we have these angry old men, right, attacking these children on social media. It, it, it That... Again, speechless. And I'm pretty sure it isn't just men. I mean, ladies, how did you feel? What was your first response when you saw those image captures of Greta's angry face as she spoke to the UN? All those different versions of her mad face. How did you respond? What was your first response? Probably something like, ooh, young lady, you know, they're not supposed to catch us with that face on. Yeah, well, I've been angry for a long time, too. I get it. I get it. Letting go of illusion, this this beautiful illusion that we get to have whatever we want, however we want it, whenever we want it, is really hard to let go of, especially when you think you're entitled to it. That makes it even harder to let go of. I get it. You feel like you're losing something that is yours. I get that. And I also get that it is really frightening to look at what is happening in the world around us. It is really, really scary. And to look at it, to really look at the scale of what is going on around us, it is really hard to not feel completely impotent. And we know who doesn't like feeling impotent. So what, you lash out at a child? Okay, that part I don't get, clearly. Nonetheless, here we are. The great diversity of human life here on the planet has got to get its shit together, right? So the point of all of this today (laughs) is that these are all patterns of response we've already been given by our ancestors and their unresolved lives. Living our excessive life on the backs of children began with child labor, 
where a bunch of orphaned, poor kids worked day in, day out in ridiculous conditions. They didn't get a childhood. Someone else's wealth was built on their back. Someone else's lifestyle was sustained on their childhood. This is not a new idea. This is old. Old, unresolved, unreconciled, and it's time needs to be done. So actually, all of this, the values, the beliefs that lead to the choices, that lead to the actions or the inactions, these are all having a destructive force on life on Earth and are supported and influenced by unresolved ancestral patterns. And even the anger in the children's faces, the frustration with the system, that's also inherited from the unresolved dead. The way that we do activism is inherited from the unresolved dead. But what's also true is the courage in the hearts of these children to step into this level of activism and say no to the grown-ups. Well, that too is supported by the well ancestors. And it's an entirely different group of ancestors than those that support our worst behavior, our actions and inactions that drive us towards an unsustainable way of life. That there's great wisdom with the well ancestors. And we could all do better by learning to reach out to them. But that too requires dealing with the unresolved dead. And so it is important for us to understand that in the beauty of that righteous anger, in the power of that message, that willingness to sacrifice the expected life for this possible life, in all of that inspiration in the actions of these children, we see the well ancestors we see the exact same support you and I could be reaching out for in our lives to do that thing we passionately need to step up in our life to do, to speak out for that thing we want to give life to so deeply and to do whatever it is that we can actually do for our world, for air, for earth, for water, for fire. And this is the battle, in a sense, right here, is for the fire that burns in each one of us. Will we allow the ancestors, the unresolved ancestors, to drive that fire in old ways and give us old answers? Or will we take charge of our passion, our life force, and use it to do what we've come here to do? Will we reach out to those dead who bring all that is good and true and beautiful into our lives as this collective wisdom of the well ancestors? And I want to say something uh, about well ancestors because well ancestors didn't necessarily do it right in their life. Some of them did. A lot of them did. Many of them lived well, uh, left their life, their relationships were reconciled and completed. They lived their soul's purpose. They didn't leave their life unlived. They loved. They, they, they spoke up for what was right and true. They were kind, they helped where they could help, and they said no where they needed to say no. They did, they lived well. They make great ancestors. But you know what? Ancestors that really messed up make great ancestral helping spirits too. If they can get to the place in the process of dying where they can reconcile their life. Because in the reconciliation of their life, they can see now the lesson of how they could have done it better. And I don't know about you, but I'm a living person. I make mistakes a lot. 
And to have someone who can lean in in the midst of that mistake and go, um, ah, don't do that. I did that. It didn't go well. To have that kind of ancestor is really helpful too because they are also the well ancestors. It's not about the fact that you were a perfect person because frankly no one is. It's about the fact that you see your life from the perspective of you as a spirit and you see it all come together and you understand the meaning in all of your life and the lessons that were there for you, those learned and unlearned, and you really come to coalesce, what wisdom does your soul carry from this lifetime? And then you bring that to the living as a, as a good, true, and beautiful ancestral helping spirit. And we have way more ancestral helping spirits than we do ancestral problems but the problems are weighing pretty heavily on us right now and our refusal as the living to step into our responsibility to deal with the dead as irritating and frustrating as that is because i that is, that is by the way the appropriate response the first time you learn about unresolved ancestral energies i mean the messed up things other people did in their lives And then you find out, I actually have to clean that mess up for them as a living? What are you, nuts? That's a totally appropriate response. It shows you've got really healthy boundaries. And we still have to fix the problem. So we can either propagate the problem or fix the problem. If we fix the problem, we have the possibility of fixing a whole bunch of other problems. If we don't fix the problem, we're going to address those other problems But we're going to come up with answers that are exactly like our ancestors did. And right now, frankly, people, that's killing us, literally, quite literally. So what are you going to do about that is my question. For me, I'm offering you a way out. Okay. So before I get to that, though, I want to take a moment and honor and give thanks to all of the good, true, and beautiful ancestors who help us with the courage in our hearts. I have gratitude to those ancestors that help us to feel hope when the situation looks pretty hopeless. And I give enormous gratitude to those ancestral helping spirits that lean in and help us find strength in our heart, clarity in our mind when we are just done. I have so much gratitude to those ancestors that help us do it anyway. And I have enormous gratitude to those ancestors that sit with us in the silence as we do the things we need to do to cultivate and to heal and to regroup for the next day. And so I'm enormously grateful to the ancestors. As I said, you know, whether they were courageous themselves and thus support my courage or whether they were cowards, but they reconciled that and now they can support my courage. I'm grateful for all of them because I am absolutely clear I need all the help I can get, and you guys do too. So I'm grateful for all of those good, true, and beautiful ancestors who support us, the living, in stepping out of the systems that are not sustainable, no matter the effort that that takes, no matter the ramifications on our life. I am grateful for those of you that help us to stand up and to live into what is just and true. And to release those deeply ingrained systems of injustice. And just stand for a moment for what is right. And then together figure out, okay, what do we build together based on the idea of justice for all equally? And I give gratitude to these ancestors for giving us the strength to imagine something that is a different version of the status quo that is a truly new answer that is not just a new way to have some other people be allowed in 
to the in group who get all the goodies. We need to recognize this system here on this planet, when you watch how nature operates, it was never about anybody getting all the goodies. And so we need to understand all the unresolved ancestral patterns that lead to that way of thinking and those systems that support that. And so I give gratitude to Greta, to her family, and to her ancestors. And I give gratitude to Isri Hirsi, who fights for social justice and climate activism. Gratitude to her family and her ancestors. I give gratitude to Altum, Autumn sorry, Peltier. She fights for social justice. She fights for water conservation and indigenous water rights. I give gratitude to her family and to her ancestors. I give bat- gratitude to Bruno Rodriguez, who is an environmental activist from Brazil, which is currently burning. Yeah, gratitude to his family and gratitude to his ancestors. I give gratitude to Helena Galinga from the Ecuadorian Amazon. From her perspective, she has been fighting over climate issues or for climate issues her entire life. She's only 17. And she's been fighting against the big oil companies. I give gratitude to her family and to her ancestors. And I give gratitude to Mari Kopni, who's 12, started at 8. She's an advocate for clean drinking water here in the United States. And I give gratitude to her family, gratitude, gratitude to her ancestors. So these are all children who are not living a regular child's life because they're fighting for their future. They give gratitude to these children, to their courage, their families, their ancestors, and all the other children I haven't named who've invented ways to clean up the oceans or bring water to their village, clean water to their village, to harness the wind to bring power to their villages, Gratitude to those who honor being alive and the powerful possibility in that to create change. And to those who do what isn't easy, what isn't comfortable. And I give gratitude to all the ancestors that support them in doing that. So what are we going to do? What are you going to do? So one of the many things that I am doing is I'm going to offer you a way to learn safely, effectively, and efficiently to lift this ancestral burden off these children. Honestly, if that's all we did, connect to our well ancestors and begin to clear out the unwell ancestors to lift this burden off the shoulders of these children – and their compatriots around the world, that would be grand. That would be unbelievable. We don't even know, actually, what that would mean. The tiniest, tiniest bit of ancestral healing that have come just through me with my clients and my students, I am one person. I can only do so much. But the change that's been created in just that tiny drop in the bucket is a big bucket. So what if you all joined me? What if you all learned to skillfully do the basics, which is what all humans have done prior to our contemporary times? And so this is why I'm offering online courses Because y'all are online. Y'all are listening to a podcast. Most of you aren't going to get yourselves to Portland, Oregon. And besides, Portland, Oregon isn't the only place that needs the change. We need to be everywhere in all of our families, in all of our cultures, on all of our continents, everywhere, doing the hard work that needs to be done. Doing it because it's right, because you can, 
because you have the skills and doing it even when it's uncomfortable and doing it anyway. Oh, because we owe a better future to our children than the one that we are giving them. And we can actually influence that. We aren't impotent. So, a long time ago, oh, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, I began teaching different versions of ancestral healing to people that would come into my classes, here, there, and everywhere in the United States. And uh, I have offered versions of ancestral healing at different sort of levels of engagement over that time. It's not so much that the work has changed, it's broadened and evolved. And uh, now, I guess now the way I would say I see it is that there, there are things everyone needs to do because the living need to be in right relationship with their ancestors. And the unresolved ancestors, a.k.a. the dead, ghosts, need to get out of here. This isn't where they belong. It's not good for them. It's not good for us. So that whole thing needs to be changed. And we're all living. And so we all need to understand how to do that piece. And then there's a next level, which is some of that healing the unresolved ancestors is a little sticky and a little problematic. And you need a little bit more skills to do that. And then some of it's really awful. And you need some serious skills and experience to do that. But the beauty of the basics is they can be offered in a way that you can learn to easily discern what is yours to do and what is not. So, this is my plan. This is my idea. But I've also been doing it for a long time. And I've told different stories in these different shows about ancestral healing over the last few weeks. And all of them are in the archives for those of you that missed them. Oh, and if you need a point of reference, it's uh, October 1st, 2019. Okay. So 20 some odd years ago, I was teaching one of the early versions of ancestral healing with some students in New York. And um, this one woman came out of a journey and she had this wonderful image. And so what we were working on in these journeys was learning to see the overlay of the unresolved ancestors. So Reality is here. There is a reality, by the way. <laughs> well, that's a little dubious these days, but there is a reality here, an energetic reality that we share. And then we all have our own stories that we overlay on that reality that are based on the stories that we carry within ourselves. So it's our projections onto reality. Um, and some of those stories may be wise, um, stories to carry around that help us to be literally and actually safe in the world and others may be complete fabrications and projections that are real only in your own head and what those stories are are influenced by um, our cultures um, influenced by the belief systems we're given etc etc anyway my point my point is the unresolved energies of the ancestors also overlay that reality and because of the sequence of things so if you think about the fact that you are conceived the unresolved ancestral patterns are already in play they are already overlaying reality so from the moment of your conception your view of reality granted you don't have any eyes to view it yet but the point is from the literally from the moment of your conception the ancestral patterns are already distorting reality. Okay, just take that in for a minute. Okay, so as you grow up and learn about reality from your family, many of those ancestral patterns are being reinforced by other family members because it's affected their reality as well. And so at this point in time, most contemporary people, unless they're very um, living very close to the way their ancient indigenous ancestors lived, most of us don't see reality. We see a version of reality that is tainted not only by our own stories, but deeply influenced by ancestral stories. Now, here's the issue. Aren't they all stories? Well, yes and no. Yes, they're human stories. No, because... 
relative to my stories that I make up about the world, I knew a time before them. Right? I was living. I was a person. I was developing in my mother's womb. I was born. I was having a life before I learned those stories. So I have a point of reference that is clean, clear, you know, a zero point. With the ancestral patterns, I don't have that. None of you have it. None of us have it because they were already in play. And so the purpose of this course then was to work with our helping spirits and our well ancestors to teach us how in the journey space we could see the way we see reality. And then we could ask the ancestral helping spirits, the the well ones, to lift the overlay of the unresolved ancestors to see what part of reality was real, what part of it was our stories, and what part of it was actually ancestral stories. And for many people, this was just like realizing they had always thought that color up there was the blue sky, but they'd actually been seeing orange their whole life and had no idea they had been. I mean, it was really so profound for people to see this overlay on reality. They, they were given, they inherited from their unresolved ancestors and how deeply it influenced what they perceived of as simply actual factual reality. And so that was the, really the purpose of the course was to help people learn to see through that ancestral, unresolved ancestral overlay so they could begin to uh, free up their own life from the imposition of those ancestral energies. Um, And then once they got themselves freed up, the next step in that particular sequence of classes was to learn how to begin to transform the unresolved energy of the ancestors to remove that distortion completely. Um, which is, you know, granted another issue, but, but this was what was really interesting about that course was just watching people's eyes bug out and their minds boggled by how different reality was literally between journeys when they lift, learned with the help of their helping spirits to lift up this unresolved energy. So anyway, back to this woman in class, the image she was given was a chest of drawers, you know, like you would put your clothes in. And um, when she saw the, saw the chest of drawers, it was a beautiful antique chest of drawers, you know, a little hint there from the spirit world and the symbolic language, antique inherited chest of drawers. But it was beautiful, beautifully carved. It, all the drawers were pushed in. It was beautifully oiled. It was a lovely wooden um, chest of drawers. And then uh, she asked, so that was her version of reality. It was all good. It's all comfortable. It's all tucked away, right? And then she asked to see it uh, without this ancestral overlay. And when she went into that journey, she she saw all the drawers pulled out kind of cattywampus, this way and that, half in, half out. And not only that, but the stuff in the drawers was completely disorganized. So... You had underwear and pants and shirts all jumbled around in the same drawers. Nothing was folded. Um, uh, Oh, clean clothes were in there with dirty clothes or dirty clothes room with clean clothes. And then what was really interesting as the class went on with this wonderful metaphor she was given by spirit to work with, she started finding hidden things in the backs of drawers and secret compartments filled with poison and all this crazy stuff. So it was, it was a wonderful, rich, simple metaphor to work with. What was important is uh, for the, our story here today is – she came out of the journey seeing this messy, cattywampus disaster of a chest of drawers that was so different than the original version. And she asked the spirits then, you know, what what was the nature of this um, actual chaos? Like this, she had this, this uh, she perceived that things were all organized and, you know, put away. But in reality, they were a mess. 
and and that this idea that they were all organized and put away was a, was a profound illusion. And so the reality of that mess was influencing the fact that her life was a mess. And she was one of those people that didn't understand, you know, I've done a ton of work, done years of therapy, done shamanic work, had my soul retrievals back. You know, I feel good. You know, I feel like this lovely, beautiful chest of drawers. Why doesn't my life reflect that? That's pretty much the space she was coming from. So she sees it in this messy, cattywampus, falling apart chest of drawers. She asked to be shown wisely. It's a very good journey question. She asked to be shown what were the element, energies that made up the mess in the chest of drawers. And um, the ancestors said the three main elements, you know, energy patterns that were moving in there one group was coming from um, the unresolved energy of the ancestors themselves. One group was her own stories and projections she hadn't addressed yet. And the other group of energies were coming out of this mess she had going on between her her family patterns and religious patterns that – her religion deeply influenced her family in terms of family traditions and expectations, but she wasn't really practicing that religion. And so basically, like many people, she wasn't gaining anything from it because she wasn't actively practicing the religion, but she still felt bound by all of its restrictions and fears and regulations. And so it wasn't helping and it was just limiting her. So anyway, so so this was... Uh, this story is an example of seeing how your reality isn't what you think it is, how it's often much more messy and problematic than you imagine, and that some of it is yours, some of it is the ancestors, and some of it is sometimes other uh, large influences in your life. So she then asked to see a way to envision what her reality without these undue influences looked like. And she was sad after that journey because there was no chest of drawers at all. And um, she, she realized as she was sharing the journey and speaking to the sadness, because she wanted to kind of jump over the sadness, but we, we invited her to, to feel into that sadness, she realized that in her sadness, that she didn't get her beautiful chest of drawers that she was so comfortable and familiar with, and that nicely organized life that was really a disaster, in that sadness and that loss of what was familiar, she had her back turned to this vast array of energy that she didn't she realized she didn't she hadn't even really paid attention to it in the journey because she'd been attached to the fact that she was so sad by what she'd lost and so we invited her to go back into the journey space and to turn around and to see what was actually behind her and what was behind her was this vast wall, curving wall of support of the well ancestors radiating through right with nothing between the ancestors and her. And what she came to understand was lovingly maintaining the chest of drawers had operated as a block between herself and being able to connect with the well ancestors because all of her energy was focused on connecting with the unwell ancestors to the exclusion of the well ancestors. And so the next thing that she needed to do then for herself was to figure out how to be in relationship with the well ancestors when she had such a well ingrained habit or pattern of being in relationship with the unwell ancestors, the chest of drawers energy. And so she had to then 
uh, ask herself, you know, how do I ask them, actually ask the well ancestors, how do I get into and cultivate and tend right relationship with you so you can help me with this over here? And so I'm sharing this story today because it, it, it illustrates for us the beginning, the beginning of addressing the issue of angry old men, really frustrated children, men attacking children, and in the meantime, our planet is burning and, you know, things are frankly going to hell in a handbasket. Right. So how do we address that? And I can hear all these people. You shouldn't focus on the negative, Christina. We need to be positive. I am being positive because what's positive to me is not a Band-Aid on my impotence. What is positive to me is steps I can take to make real change happen in my life and the world. That's what's positive to me. And for me to get real traction on change I have to see what is going on around me accurately. And that is the piece about doing the ancestral healing that matters, is until I do what this woman did, giving up her beautiful loved chest of drawers and learning new actions to be in relationship with the well ancestors, until we each do our equivalent of that, we can't see reality. I couldn't see reality. She wasn't seeing reality. We can't engage. So we can engage our creativity and our innovation on a false sense of reality when we will come up with new answers and they will ultimately be new versions of the same problem because nothing has actually changed. We've simply been creative and innovative within the same reality. And what the little story I shared illustrates is how vastly different the reality is and how initially getting there is uncomfortable and sad for her, for example. It wasn't sad for me, but it was sad for her. And that that it is not just like, ah, the angels have descended. All is going to be well in the universe. That's not real. I mean, angels are real, but that as an answer is not real. That we, humans, are the problem and the solution. We have to change. And for us to change in a way that creates a new reality, one in which we are not spending our children's resources to live how we want to, right? A new reality, we have to see what's right in front of us differently. And the most effective way to do that right now like to change that now. I mean, that woman's life was changed in a couple hours of journeying by the answers she received from spirit. It was so clear with her chest of drawers metaphor. So we have to see reality. We have to learn to not see through the lens of the unresolved energies of the ancestors to see that reality. And when we get traction in the real reality today, Then our creativity and our inspiration and our innovation and our hope and all of our ability to move towards possibilities gets engaged towards the creation of a new future. And this is why I said that even the anger of these children is also being driven by the unresolved energy of the ancestors. Because you have this same pattern of the underdog fighting against the larger unjust system. Right? The underdog and the system need to change. We all need to change. And one of the ways that we can change our collective relationship with real reality in front of us to clear our eyes is to lift the burden of these unresolved ancestors, to help them to reconcile their lives and help them to move on to where the dead belong. It's not about judging them. It's not about uh, sorting out who are good and who are bad. They're all just humans. And yes, humans can do really horrendous things. And humans can be miracles. 
And this is all in our ancestral line, all of it. And so our task then as the living is to change the balance of the scales. Right now, the unresolved energy of the ancestors that we all have to deal with is tipping the scales in the favor of the old answers continuing, which drives towards lots of extinction, potentially including our own. And so we want to tip the scales because the well ancestors are like that great wall of support and love and inspiration and courage and everything that that wall of ancestors uh, offered to that woman who had that help all the time. She just had her back turned to it, literally, and was weeping in her sorrow for what she had lost without any real awareness of what she had gained by simply changing who she would be in relationship with and understanding how to draw her energy out of the old relationship with the unresolved ancestors and put her energy into the new relationship with the well ancestors. Okay. So that's the point that I wanted to make today is that healing the unresolved energy of the ancestors allows us to see reality in a real way. It allows us to see our possibilities in a real way. It will help us to be not so deeply embedded in our diversity as problem and be able to start to see diversity as asset. Um, so anyway, my point is clearing the unresolved energy of the ancestors helps us to see reality, to see ourselves in a more realistic way, and to see the possibilities that are there that we really can't see right now, right? And that we need to make those changes because until we do, all of our efforts to create the new future are built on the old foundation and will be infected by that energy. And so, so this is the thing. Healing the ancestors isn't the point. It's a necessary step to get us to the point. And so we need to get at it. So with that said, I want to remind you all that my course begins in a week from today, which is September, uh, sorry, October 1st, 2019. The course begins October 9th, 2019. If the time the course is happening, which is noon on Wednesdays, doesn't work for you because you're somewhere else on the globe or you're working or whatever, have no fear. Everything is recorded. You can still work through it in this kind of asynchronous way where you're doing it on your time but contributing to the group and the questions in, in, your, in your own time. It's fine. It works really well after – this is my third year investing my time and energy in online courses, and it works really well. And this course is designed for online learning. You can go to my website, lastmaskcenter.org, and click on the link there to register. This is a course that's being produced by Shift Network, um, Healing with Your Well and Unwell Ancestors. And I also want to remind you that tomorrow – Elida Birch's masterclass is happening for those of you that are focused right now on manifesting, which is also important to do. Her masterclass is uh, October 2nd. You can also register for her masterclass at lastmaskcenter.org. Um, so I give gratitude for the ancestors for standing around us, for being patient and ever present. I give gratitude to the earth below, our most ancient ancestor, to the sky above. Without these two, there really wouldn't be anything here. And I give gratitude for the life that we get to live between earth and sky. And gratitude to the heart that beats within each one of us. May we be inspired in this day to do what is right and true and do what is going to make the world a better place for our grandkids, grandkids, grandkids. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.